it's hard sometimes to improve on an original. Uh, Coca-Cola learned that some years ago. For many years, they had a product called Coca-Cola that was a very popular soft drink here in the United States. It occupied perhaps 60, 70 percent of the market uh, for a long time, but in recent years, with the advent of Pepsi and its taste tests and the apparent preference that particularly young people had for the sweeter taste of Pepsi, uh, sales of Coca-Cola were declining and their market share was declining rather rapidly. So executives at Coca-Cola thought it was time to make a change. It was time to change, uh, not just by adding a new uh, soft drink or a new uh, taste uh, to the general makeup of what they were doing, but they were going to take the original product, Coca-Cola, and change that as well, change the recipe. They went through a variety of taste tests. They came up with a product that they thought was very good. They did some test marketing and had people taste the new Coke as opposed to the old Coca-Cola. And it was preferred by most folks within these test markets. So the executives thought they'll, they'll roll out this new product. It'll compete with Pepsi, have a, a better taste than even what Pepsi offers, sweeter than Pepsi. And they thought they would be able to re return uh, their market share. Well, in 1985, that's what they did. They uh, announced that they were going to uh, stop producing the old Coca-Cola and bring out the new Coke. And there was a big marketing campaign for this, and uh, off it went. But people, particularly in the South, the region where uh, Coca-Cola originated, were very, very upset that Coca-Cola would change the recipe, the original recipe of their drink. Now, maybe they might have agreed in a blind taste test that the new Coke tasted better than the old Coke, but you don't mess with the original. And so there was such an outcry against the new Coke that eventually they had to bring back, the, within three months, they brought back the old Coke flavor and then called it Coke Classic. And so if you go out in the supermarkets today, you'll see Coke Classic. And then the new flavor was Coke 2. I don't know if that's even still on the market now or not. But we're back to the old Coke. And in fact, their sales did pick up with the, result, with the return of the old Coke. It's hard to improve upon an original. The Apostle Paul felt the same way, not so much about the beverages that he drank, but about the gospel that he preached. The original gospel that he preached in his missionary journeys through Galatia and other regions of, of uh, the Middle East was a message that he received from Jesus Christ, and therefore it was the true message, the original message. And you don't tamper with this original formula. You don't change it, manipulate it, try to adjust it to uh, fabricate it in such a way that it pleases more people, wins a greater audience, and brings more people into the churches. We don't test market the gospel and evaluate whether people find it more satisfying than the original form. The gospel is not a product uh, like even Coca-Cola that you can manipulate the taste of to please a greater audience and, and build your market share. The gospel is what it is. And you don't change it. And that's the point that Paul wanted to make to the churches of Galatia. That the original gospel that he preached, that pristine original, that uh, uh, full presentation of the work of Christ that he presented to them, is a, is a message that you do not mess around with because it is from God Himself. It is God's Word, God's description for how we are made right with God. Now in this letter to the Galatians, he's going to speak to them about the nature of how we are made right with God, how man is justified before God. And he's going to begin here now as the, if you will, the thunder cloud breaks and the storm hits right here at the front of the letter, he's going to remind the people of Galatia that the gospel that he preached, this gospel of justification by grace through faith alone, is a gospel that should not be tampered with. 
And he places a stern warning against those who would do anything like that. As Paul begins this letter, he dispenses with the usual pleasantries that begin uh, most of his letters. He, you recall, we'll often say, not only grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, but then he will say, I give thanks to God for you. And then he, in all my mentions and, and prayers before God, giving thanks for your love, your faith, your hope, and all these different things. And so Paul often will express his appreciation for God's work among the congregation at the beginning of the letter. Here he does nothing of the sort. He doesn't begin by giving thanks for God's work among these people because there's not much to give thanks for. And he is so concerned and so, if you will, upset with what he has heard about what is taking place in Galatia that he dispenses with these pleasantries and gets right to the point. When he does that, you know that there is something very serious that he has to talk about. Anyone comes up to you and dispenses with, hi, how are you doing, how are things at home, all these kinds of things, just gets right to the point, you know that there's a confrontation in store. Hi. And that's what Paul does here. He begins by saying, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by his grace in Christ. I am astonished. I am amazed. It's a word that is used to describe that earlier in the gospel accounts, the, the reaction of the crowds when they saw Jesus performing his miracles and the presence of the supernatural, the, the marvelous way in which these things came about was so astonishing that they were left amazed and uh, astounded by what Christ had done. It was so out of the ordinary that in some ways they couldn't make sense of it all. Paul says with regard to the people of Galatia, I am astonished, not in a favorable way, at the miraculous way which God is at work among you, but I am astonished that here you have a gospel of Jesus Christ that satisfies all your needs, and yet you are abandoning that and going after something else, another gospel. How can this be? It was just beyond Paul to comprehend how people who so recently heard the message of God's grace would turn from that message of grace and, and follow after another gospel message. How can this be? And it is amazing to see how the, the message of the gospel comes into an individual's heart or into a home, uh, into a church. And people follow it for a while, but then there are persecutions, there are troubles, there are different teachings that come in, and then they begin to drift away. They begin to look after other things which seem so much grander, have so much more appeal. And they run after that. It's astonishing. Paul would have to deal with a group of people called the Judaizers, who were Jewish Christians, who would come after Paul into the communities and teach them the way of God more perfectly than what Paul would have to say. And they advocated that, yes, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, He's the Messiah, we believe that He died on the cross, we believe His miracles, we even believe that He rose from the dead on the third day. We accept all these things, and we understand that Christ must forgive you for your sins. All that, we agree with you. But, in order for you to be saved, you also have to observe the law of Moses. And so here's where they differ from Paul. Paul said, Christ saves you completely. He does everything for you. He takes away all of your sins. And he provides you with a perfect righteousness that fully satisfies all that God can expect or demand from you. Christ does it all for you. There is a complete salvation for you in Jesus Christ. But what the Judaizers said was, no, the work of Christ is limited. There is an initial forgiveness of sins. Uh, there is a, a call to embrace Christ as your Messiah. But you need to follow up with that by observing the laws of Moses. You need to be circumcised. You need to observe the various rituals of the Old Covenant law. And if you obey these things, then you will be saved. In fact, they began to criticize Paul and his gospel and saying it's a man-pleasing gospel. It uh, goes to the Gentiles who really don't want to be circumcised or observe all these 
laws, these Jewish laws. They don't want to observe all of these things. And so what Paul does is he says, I will simplify things. I'll just say Jesus does it all. And that satisfies everyone. But the Judaizers said, that's not enough. If people are going to stay by the law, if they're going to live moral lives, then they, they still have to have their salvation hanging out there in the balance. And they need to work their way towards that. Now, yeah. this ancient heresy that Paul had to deal with, that Christ was not sufficient, that you need to supplement his work with your own good works, is that which comes to us in many different forms and fashions today. It's not just an ancient problem, but it is a modern problem. The configuration changes somewhat. It's not so much that we need to be circumcised and observe all the rituals of the Mosaic Law Code, but rather it is that yes, Christ cleanses you of your sin, He gets you started on the Christian life, but you have to follow up and complete that with your own good works. Or it may be that Christ gives you an example to follow, and if you wish to enjoy God's favor and blessing in your life, then you need to do the same without really a sense that Christ is the atoning sacrifice for sin, or that His righteousness is given to you so that you can stand perfect in God's sight. Many in churches today are abandoning the original gospel for these other gospels where we supplement what Christ does with our own good works, with our own performances. They may do that in various good works that we do. We might say that, well, faith is our new good work. God recognized that we could not obey His law perfectly, and so He gave us a substitute. And that is, just simply believe. If you believe, then you will be saved. Well, your faith is not a good work. You're not saved because you exercise faith. Faith is simply the, 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 the means through which you receive Christ's righteousness. It itself is not the righteousness that justifies you. Your faith is not a good work which earns favor with God. Faith is passive. And it receives the righteousness from Christ that saves you. It's that righteousness, that death of Christ on your behalf is what saves you, not your exercise of faith. And what you have in many evangelical churches today is this talk about my faith, my choice. It is a substitute for God's law. God recognized that I couldn't obey the law very perfectly, and so He brought in the second way of operating. All I have to do is believe. And that we credit it as righteousness. That's to fundamentally misunderstand the gospel message. And once more, to secretly introduce human merits, human works, into the equation. We'll talk more about what faith really means here in the sermons to come. But faith is an instrument through which we receive Christ's righteousness. It is not the righteousness itself. It's not by believing that we are saved, simply in and of itself. It's by believing in Jesus and receiving what He has done for us. We'll need to develop that further as we go along. But this is a modern problem. Wishing to add to what Christ has done the things that we do as well and making them meritorious for salvation. If you do that, then you lose any confidence that you will be saved because you can always lose your faith you can always fall short of your own good works.